the outcome number four of module four, we will be covering the bone anatomy, mainly the different parts of the bones and also how we classify the different types of bones. With regards to bone anatomy, there are several parts of the bone that we will discuss. Some of them we have already talked about. For example, diaphysis and epiphysis we talked about in previous slides, articular cartilage as well, periosteum, endosteum, medullary cavity. Just the metaphysis is something that we have not talked about, but we will discuss them in this learning outcome. Epiphysis here has an E because when it's plural, instead of an I, we substitute it for an E. So just keep that in mind when you see it throughout the lecture. A typical long bone like this one, which is the femur, it will show the gross anatomical characteristics of the bone. The diaphysis, which diaphysis means growing between, it will be the part of the bone that's in between the extremities. It can also be called the bone shaft or the body. It's usually going to be long and cylindrical, and it's going to be the main portion of the bone. The epiphysis, which is located in the extremities of the bone. Therefore, we're gonna have two of them, a proximal one that's going to be closer to the torso and a distal epiphysis that will be at the distal end of the bone. That's why when we refer to the epiphysis as both ends, we have to use it with an E instead of an I for plural. The metaphysis is going to be the part in between so it's going to be in between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. And we do also have two metaphysis, one on each end of the bone. In a growing bone, each metaphysis is going to contain what we call an epiphyseal plate or an epiphyseal growth plate, which is going to be a layer of hyaline cartilage that will allow the diaphysis of the bone to grow in length which is a process that we will describe later on in this module. When grown both in length stops, somewhere between the ages of 14 and 24, the cartilage in the epiphyseal plate is going to be replaced by bone, and the resulting bony structure will be known as epiphyseal line. So on this image, we actually see the epiphyseal line because this is representing an adult femur. The articular cartilage, which we talked already about, is going to be this thin layer of hyaline cartilage that's covering the part of the epiphysis where the bone forms an articulation, which is a joint with another bone. The articular cartilage is going to be there to reduce the friction and absorb the shock at these freely movable joints. Because the articular cartilage lacks the perichondrium and it lacks blood vessels, if there is a damage to this region, it's really, really hard to repair. So this is why we do have lots of patients that undergo hip replacement in this case for the femur because this end of the femur will articulate with the hip bone or they can also go undergo, for example, knee replacement, which is also very common. The periosteum, which peri means around, it's going to be this tough connective tissue sheath and it's associated blood supply that will surround the bone surface whenever it is not covered by articular cartilage. So everywhere in the bone, we will see periosteum except in the extremities where we do have articular cartilage that will be forming a joint. This periosteum is going to be composed of two layers. There's going to be an outer fibrous layer that's made up of dense irregular connective tissue and an inner osteogenic layer that will consist of cells. Some of the cells will enable the bone to grow in thickness, but not in length. And we will talk more about the growth in thickness later on as well. Besides assisting the bone with the growth in width, the periosteum has several other functions, which is to protect the bone, to assist in fracture repair. It also helps to nourish bone tissue and it serves as an attachment point for ligaments and tendons. The periosteum is going to be attached to the underlying bone by fibers that are called perforating fibers, which are thick bundles of collagen that will extend from the periosteum into the bone extracellular matrix. 
The medullary cavity, or also known as marrow cavity, is going to be the inside of the bone. So it's this hollow cylindrical space within the diaphysis that will contain fatty yellow bone marrow and also numerous blood vessels in adults. This cavity is important because it will minimize the weight of the bone by reducing the dense bone material where it is least needed. The long bones tubular design will provide maximum strength with minimum weight, which is ideal for our body. The endosteum is the thin membrane that will line the medullary cavity. It also contains a single layer of bone forming cells and a small amount of connective tissue. Therefore, since it's lining the medullary cavity, it will be in close contact with the yellow marrow. Bones can also be classified according to their shape. In addition, in this lecture, we will be covering the different types of bones. An adult skeleton will have 206 individual bones, which do come in a variety of sizes and shapes. So it is important for us to know the specific bone feature that is common to each bone, as this will help us to identify each one of them. Not only that, but each one of us will create our own bone features that are unique to each of us. And this is helpful in identifying a specific individual. When analyzing bones, they can tell us information, for example, about age, about size, height, gender, health, and race. Also, depending on what type of activities you do or certain injuries you had during your lifespan, it will form specific bone features that are unique to you. And this is going to be helpful in identifying your body if this is ever needed. I know it's a little bit creepy, but nonetheless, it is very important to know. As we can see here on the slide, we can separate the bones into seven different categories, which are the long bones, the short bones, the flat bones, irregular, sesamoid, pneumatized, and sutural bones. The most common types are the first five, but we do have two other types that sometimes it's not mentioned, but I do think it's important for us to know and we will cover them in the next slides. First, let's talk about the long bones, which will have greater length than width and consists of a diaphysis, which is the shaft, and usually two epiphyses, one on each extremity or ends. As you can see from this image, especially when observing the clavicle, these long bones, they are slightly curved and so are all the other long bones, even though it might not be very noticeable. This slight curvature is important for strength as a curved bone absorbs the stress of the body's weight at several different points so that it is evenly distributed. If these bones were straight, the weight of the body would be unevenly distributed and the bone would fracture easily. Long bones consist mostly of compact bone tissue, which is dense and has smaller spaces, but they also contain considerable amount of spongy bone tissue, which has larger spaces. Most of the spongy bone will be located in the epiphysis, and this is important to make the bones lighter. The examples that we have here on this image are the humerus, which is your arm bone, the ulna and the radius, which are your forearm bones, the femur, which is your thigh bone, the tibia and the fibula, which are your leg bones, and the clavicle, which is your collarbone. There are other bones that are long as well, and I will talk about them in the next few slides. Here we have the short bones which are somewhat cubed shaped and nearly equal in length, width, and depth. They consist of spongy bone except at the surface where there is a thin layer of compact bone. Examples of short bones are the carpal bones, which are your wrist bones, and most tarsal bones, which are your ankle bones. I really will not go into much detail with regards to the wrist and ankle bones, but for now just know that there are eight wrist bones and all of them are considered to be short. And there are seven ankle bones, and all of them except one is considered to be a short bone. The one that is not considered to be a short bone is the calcaneus, which is your heel bone, 
And as you can see from this image, it is this very big bone right over here. The calcaneus is considered to be an irregular bone, and I will cover it when we get to the irregular bones. In this image, we also see these other bones, which are called metacarpals, that are present in the hand. The version of the metacarpals on the foot is called metatarsals, right over here. And then we have the phalanges, which are the bones that will form the fingers and the toes. And these are the ones that are considered long bones as well. So together, the metacarpals, the metatarsals, and the phalanges, they're all grouped together and they are considered long bones. Flat bones are generally thin and they're going to be composed of two nearly parallel plates of compact bone enclosing a layer of spongy bone. Flat bones are going to afford considerable protection and they're also going to provide extensive areas for muscle attachment. They include the cranial bones, which are your skull bones, which protect the brain, the sternum, which is your breastbone and the ribs, which protect the organs in the thorax, which are your lungs and your heart, and also the scapula, which are your shoulder blades. In addition, we can have the pelvic bone, or the oxcoxa, also be considered a flat bone. Now, sometimes you guys get a little bit confused with the rib, because the rib does look like a long bone. However, it does have a very thin layer of spongy bone between these two parallel plates of compact bone. So this is why it's considered a flat bone. So definitely don't let that get you confused. Irregular bones have complex shapes and they cannot be grouped into any of the three categories just described. They also vary in the amounts of spongy and compact bone that they contain. Such bones include the vertebrae, which are your backbones, some facial bones like the temporal over here, the calcaneus, which is the heel bone, which we saw on the previous slide, and the sphenoid, which has this butterfly shape and is considered to be a cranial bone. In addition, I added the coxal bone again on this category because the coxal bone can either be considered a flat bone, like we saw previously, or an irregular bone, like seen here. The sesamoid bones, which are these shaped like a sesame seed, they will develop in certain tendons where there is a considerable friction, compression, and a physical stress. They are not always completely ossified, and they do measure only a few millimeters to centimeters in diameter, except for the two patella, which are the kneecaps. These are going to be the largest of the sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones, they vary in number from person to person, except for the patella, which are located in the quadriceps femoris tendon, as you can see right over here on this image, and they are normally present in all individuals. Functionally, the sesamoid bones, they will protect the tendons from this excessive wear and tear, especially since they are located right over here on the knee joint, and they can alter the direction of pull of a tendon, which will improve the mechanical advantage at that joint. There are some sesamoid bones that are found in the upper limb, especially on the hands, but we won't go into details about those. The sesamoid bones that I want you to know are just the patellas. Then we go to the category of pneumatized bones. There's only one type of pneumatized bone, which is the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is this bone highlighted here on this image in orange that will be right behind the nasal bone. And as you can see, it has this very weird shape and it also has lots of different pockets. And that's why it's called pneumatized bone. Pneumatized reminds me of pneumonia. That reminds me of lungs. And lungs has lots of little holes and pockets. So this is why the ethmoid bone is called a pneumatized bone. The last type of bone is this bone that's not classified by shape, but rather by location. The sutural bones, which are also called wormian bones, they are going to be the small bones that are located within the sutures or joints of certain cranial bones. The number of sutural bones will vary greatly from person to person and not everybody has them. But as you can see, they're going to be located right in between the sutures. 
In this example, we have the limb doido suture right over here between the occipital bone and the parietal bones. And you can see these little tiny bones right over here. So these are your sutural bones.